Once they landed on the surface of the moon, capsule communicator Charlie Duke back at NASA acknowledged the landing by saying, we copy you down, Eagle. And Armstrong responded, responded to Duke by saying, Houston, tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Now basically when Armstrong, his change of call sign from Eagle to Tranquility Base basically confirmed that they had landed and the landing was successful. Okay? Now once all that occurred, because they were long and because they were having trouble landing, this is what Duke responded once they landed. He said, Roger Tranquility, we cop you on the ground. You've got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Because they were really concerned that they were not going to land correctly and have issues. Okay? Now, once these guys landed on the moon, they were supposed to have a five-hour sleep period. That was their first job when they landed on the moon, is they were supposed to have a five-hour sleep period. Now, if you've been through all of this, what are your chances probably of sleeping very well? Fine. Not very well. And they understood that as well. So instead of sleeping, they prepared for the actual stepping on the moon, the evacuation onto the moon. They knew they were going to be unable to sleep anyway, so they, they forego the sleep operation, which was called for that sleep time, and they decide to prepare to leave the lab for the moon which takes us to the lunar surface operations. What are they going to do on the moon? Okay, the astronauts from inside the LEM were planning what was called the EASEP. They were planning the EASEP, which is on your ID sheet, which stood for Early Apollo Scientific Experiment Package. So the astronauts inside the LEM were planning for the EASEP, the Early Apollo Scientific Experiment Package. They were trying to figure out where they were going to place that. Okay, we'll talk about that more. And they also were trying to plan from inside the limb where they were going to place the American flag as well. What is that EASCP for? Early Apollo Scientific Experiment Package, and you'll understand that totally or what it is in a minute. So they basically are looking out the windows of the limb, trying to predict where they're going to get off and what they're going to do and how they're going to plan this experiment package. So finally, on Monday, July 21st, 1969, on Monday, July 21st, 1969, Armstrong opened the hatch of the LEM. He opened the hatch of the LEM. Now, what did they have on? Suits and backpacks. And these backpacks were, you know, you've seen the big backpacks on the astronauts. Those were needed to cool their body heat during the moonwalk, okay? So that basically cooled their body heat because it was a different temperature on the moon. So they had these big space suits on these backpacks. Now, an interesting little deal, this is kind of an interesting deal. You wouldn't think it happened on something as important as this. The backpack was redesigned after... A, a earlier Apollo missions, like Apollo 9, they redesigned the backpack after these missions. They didn't pay as much attention as they should have to the lunar module hatch. And actually, this backpack was larger than the ones before. Okay? So Armstrong had to wiggle his way through the hatch to get down the nine rung ladder to the moon's surface. And he was having a little difficulty getting the bigger backpack out the hatch. Can you imagine if this mission goes to heck because they weren't thinking when they redesigned the backpack and he couldn't get out of the limb or got stuck? But he did wiggle his way through and according to NASA, they monitor your heart rates on these astronauts and it was this time during the mission 
that Armstrong and Aldrin had the largest, or not large, they had the uh, uh, highest heart rates. Okay, highest heart rates, because they weren't sure if they were going to get out of the limb or they were going to get stuck in the limb. And once they got out in the limb, you might you ever been in a situation where you got out of something, but then getting back in was a little different story because of, you know, however it's put together. Well, they were a little interested. So as soon as Armstrong stepped out of the hatch, now there's a nine-rung ladder he's got to go down, he activates his TV camera from the side of the eagle. He activates his TV camera from the side of the eagle and started his way down the ladder. As he was going down the ladder, he described the surface of the moon as dusty, very fine-grained, and almost like powder, is how he described the, the lunar surface. As it was a surface dust, very fine-grained, and almost like powder. So he makes his way, Armstrong does, he makes his way down the nine-rung ladder, and finally, he steps off Eagle's foot pad as, and he utters his famous line, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. So Armstrong then stepped off Eagle's foot pad onto the surface of the moon and uttered his famous line back to Earth, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What did Buzz, what's going on? Did he like read like think of that beforehand? I'm sure he had. I'm sure he had some planned. Yeah, just come off the top of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he had some. I'm sure he had some thought about. Well, Buzz Aldrin soon joined Armstrong on the moon's surface, and he described the view on on the moon's surface as a magnificent desolation. A magnificent desolation. So Buzz Aldrin soon joined Armstrong on the moon's surface, and he described the view from the surface of the moon as a magnificent desolation. After stepping on the moon's surface, the astronauts did the following things. And this will answer some of Tyler's questions. First thing Armstrong did, as soon as he got on the surface of the moon, is he took a soil sample, because he, and he put it in a bag, and he tucked that bag into a pocket he had on his right thigh, to guarantee that they would at least have some lunar soil brought back in case they had an emergency and they had to abandon the mission. Okay, because the mission was a lot more, the mission was a lot more than just getting a bag of moon surface. But he wanted to make sure that at least he got some moon surface. So the first thing he did is he took a, a sample of the moon surface, put it in a plastic bag, stuck it in the pocket of his right thigh, because in case they had to be back, they wanted to at least have that. Armstrong. While Armstrong took the TV camera from the lunar module and he made a panoramic sweep from where he was there. So he took the camera off and he just made a panoramic sweep of the moon. Armstrong did. Yep, just made a panoramic sweep so they could see all directions. And then after he made that panoramic sweep of the area, he mounted the camera on a tripod, tripod which was about 68 feet from the lunar module. Okay. So they, had, they set up a tripod about 68 feet from the lunar module, and after doing a panoramic view of the moon, Armstrong put the camera on that tripod. Now, is that a cordless camera? No. No. It had a, had, a, had, a, had a cable, and that cable was kind of a pain because it really presented a tripping hazard for those guys. They had to be very careful. When you're in these suits, you're not walking around real easily. It's difficult to get around. Yeah. Yeah, high knees, no kidding. So they had to be really careful that they didn't trip and fall down uh, on that cord. Now, finally, Armstrong and Aldrin planted a, a specially designed American flag on the lunar surface in clear view of the camera. So the final thing is they planted a specially designed American flag on the lunar surface. What do you think? How do you think it was specially designed? Yeah, they had to have a stick on the top. Basically, the flag, there was no wind on the moon, so when they put it in, the American flag was like this, and they had a stick that they put, or whatever you want to call so that the flag was, would stay open, it wouldn't droop. Okay? 
Well, what do you think happened? Who called the astronauts through a telephone radio transmission after they put the flag up? Okay. President Nixon did. So President Nixon then spoke to the astronauts through a telephone radio transmission from the White House, and he described his conversation with Aldrin and Armstrong as the most historic phone call ever made from the White House. Now, again, you have to understand that Nixon had a couple of things ready for this. He had a speech if it was successful, and he had a speech written if it was unsuccessful, which tells you that they thought there was about a 50-50 chance that this was even going to be a successful mission. Well, anyway, Nixon originally had a real long speech prepared to read during the phone call, but Frank Borman, fell fellow right up there, Frank Borman, who was actually at the White House as a NASA liaison during Apollo 11, convinced Nixon to keep his words brief. So Nixon had a real long speech plan to give to the astronauts when he called them, when they were on the surface of the moon. And it was Frank Borman, who was at the White House as a NASA liaison, who convinced Nixon to keep his remarks short. Why? Stuff to do. Huh? A lot of stuff to do. Well, kind of. Think about where did this all come from? Where did this moon landing all come from originally? Space race. Whose vision was it to land a man on the moon? President Kennedy. And Foreman was good friends with President Kennedy, and he asked President Nixon to respect the lunar landing as part of President Kennedy's legacy and not upstage him. And he said, keep your remarks short. Remember who vision this was, Mr. President. It wasn't yours, it was President Kennedy's. And that kind of gutsy, isn't it, for a guy who did? But he did. That's what Frank Borman did. He asked him to keep his words brief in respect to the honor of the lunar landing as part of President Kennedy's legacy. Well, after this, Armstrong and Aldrin continued to walk the moon's surface collecting rock samples, and things were going so well for them as they were being monitored by Mission Control back in Houston they gave him a 15-minute extension to be out there. So they actually got to be out there 15 minutes longer than they were planning to have him out there because things were going so well. So, again, they continued to collect rocks, samples, and talk about some other things they did. And Armstrong actually got 65 yards away from the lunar module. So he went quite a ways, 65 yards, which at that time in the spacesuit was pretty remarkable. So they were given a 15-minute extension because things were going so well to walk on the moon, and actually by the time it was over, Armstrong had walked over 65 yards from the lunar module. Where are these samples at now? We'll take we'll, we'll oh, okay. Museums. Okay, that takes us to lunar ascent and return. Lunar ascent. What is lunar ascent? Going back Go back up to the lunar module. Okay. Now, Aldrin entered Eagle first, after the astronaut's time was done on the surface of the moon. So Aldrin actually went into the LEM first. And what was, what was Armstrong doing while Aldrin got up in the LEM? He was handing him things. Two sample boxes, film, things they had collected he was handing Aldrin up into the LEM. So they had a little difficulty, but the astronauts then lifted film and two sample boxes to the lunar module hatch. So they were bringing things back. Armstrong then said to Aldrin, hey, remember our memorial items. And so Aldrin then tossed down a bag to Aldrin. Aldrin tossed down a bag to Armstrong are things they were going to leave on the moon. So Armstrong then reminded Aldrin of a bag of memorial items and Aldrin tossed the bag down to Armstrong on the moon's surface. Where were they? We'll tell you. <clears throat> Question. Yes. Is it true when they got back that they go through U.S. Customs? I don't think so. <laughs> All right. So, um, did, did they? Have? <laughs> well, I don't. Know. Well, okay, I'm gonna, I got a video right here. We're going to show you when we get done with this. It's entitled entitled Apollo 11 Facts Versus Fiction. We'll see if that's in the right. Okay, now, Armstrong then jumped 
from the sur uh, moon surface up the ladder and climb back into the limb as well. What was in the bag? We'll get to it. Now before they took off to ascend, they had to lighten the load to get back up. So they tossed several items out onto the moon's surface, including their backpacks, those big backpacks. They tossed those out. They had some lunar overshoes. They actually tossed the camera out because they took the film and a lot of other unneeded equipment that they didn't need to take back to Earth. They just tossed out because they had to lighten the load to ascend back to the command module. So they polluted the moon. They polluted the moon. Now, this is kind of an interesting thing that happened. They were settling down because the plan was they were going to sleep before they ascended back up. Well, while they were moving around in the cabin, Aldrin accidentally broke their, broke their circuit breakers that would arm the main engine to lift them back up to the moon. In other words, as a circuit breaker, you just got to take, you got a little thing, you got to click, and that's going to give you the power to send you back up. Aldrin is, is bouncing around, so to speak, in the limb, and he accidentally broke the circuit breaker off, the one that you push up to fire the engine. Well, if they can't fire the engine, where are they going to be? Forever. Forever. Yeah. So they're getting a little bit nervous. Finally, there was a button there, and they, and they found an felt tip pin, just like the ones I have, and they pushed that felt tip pin in there and were able to activate that engine firing mechanism so they could go. So anyway, they slept for about seven hours, and then they were awakened by Mission Control in Houston to prepare them for their return flight. So they slept about seven hours after that little catastrophe with the felt pin, and then the crew was awakened by Mission Control to prepare them for the return flight. Two and a half hours later, they lifted off the surface of the moon, carrying 21.5 kilograms of lunar samples with them. Okay, so after seven hours of rest, the crew was awakened by mission control to prepare for the return flight. And two and a half hours later, they lifted off carrying 21.5 kilograms of lunar samples. Here are the eight things they left on the surface of the moon. For those of you that are dying to know. Eight things. First, they left scientific instruments to measure moonquakes. They left scientific instruments to measure moonquakes. Obviously, they left that American flag there, number two. They left the flag there. They left an Apollo 1 mission patch. Why? What happened, yeah, what happened to the Apollo 1 mission, the first mission in Apollo? It caught fire. Caught fire and burned up three astronauts. In, in memory of those astronauts, they left an Apollo 11 mission patch. Oh, Apollo 1. Oh, excuse me, yeah, Apollo 1 <laughs> mission patch. They left a memorial bag. In the bag, was a gold replica of an olive branch. Is that only one or is that two? That's number four. A memorial bag. And it contained a gold replica of an olive branch. Anybody know what an olive branch signifies? Peace. Peace. Oh. Yeah, peace. peace. I it number five. Sorry. They left a silicone message disc, which had the five, he had the following five things on it. A silicone message disc. Is that like a floppy thing? It must have been. <laughs> must have been, yes. Yeah. On that, it had goodwill statements by Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. The silicone disc had goodwill statements by Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. Was it the No. 
Also, number, the second thing that silicone message disc carried was messages from leaders of 43, excuse me, messages from leaders of 73 countries around the world. So 73 different leaders in the world sent messages that were left on the surface of the moon. Russia? Yep. Silicone disc also carried a list of all members of the Senate and all members of the House. The disc also had a list of all the congressmen and senators that were responsible to pass the first NASA legislation that created NASA. So it had a list of all the congressmen and senators that were responsible for the first legislation that established NASA. And it had the names of NASA's top management, past and present. It had the names of NASA's top management, past and present. That was number five, the silicone message disk. Now this is kind of interesting in comparison to what Blake said here. The names of NASA's top management, past and present. Now what did Blake kind of comment when I said, did he, he said, did Russia make a statement? Yes, because you're thinking, gee whiz, you know, we're still in the race for space. Well, the sixth thing that was left on the surface of the moon, which I think is pretty cool, was were Soviet medals that commemorated cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. Remember him? Soviet medals that commemorated cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin being the first man in space. Is that so still there? I'm sure it is. You know, and it's, it's probably not where they left it. So we've had some trips there since. But Seventh thing that was left, it's kind of an interesting story, was a diamond-studded astronaut pin from Apollo 1. A diamond-studded astronaut pin from Apollo 1. That was owned by Deke Slayton. Do you remember who Deke Slayton was with the Mercury astronauts? Only one that didn't what? Fly a mission. His, remember? So Deke Slayton was, oh, excuse me, Deke Slayton owned a, a diamond studded astronaut pin from all one. It was given to Slayton by all of the widows of those astronauts that died in Apollo 1. So the widows of the astronauts gave Slayton this diamond studded pin from Apollo 1. And Slayton, Slayton gave it to Armstrong to put on the surface of the moon. The pin had been intended to be flown in Apollo 1. So, so another interesting thing that was taken, number six, I guess there's, uh, there's more than... Another thing Armstrong took with him was a piece of wood from what aircraft? A pirate ship? No. One, one, one. Neil Armstrong carried a piece of wood from the Wright Brothers 1903 airplane's left propeller and a piece of fabric from its wing and left it on the surface of the moon. Armstrong took a piece of wood from the Wright Brothers 1903 airplane's left propeller and also a piece of fabric from its wing and left it on the moon. And the final thing that was left there was a plaque which was mounted on the Lem ladder. They took it off and left it on the surface of the moon. What was that? What's that? What was that? A plaque. I was going to bring a picture of that day, I forgot. I missed one the, thing. What's that? Uh, what presidents had their messages on the surface? Eisenhower, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Kennedy Johnson, and Nixon. Now this plaque was kind of interesting. It had two drawings of Earth. It had the western and eastern hemisphere, hemispheres driven, drawn on it. And it had an, ex, an, ex, uh, an inscrip, inscription that stated, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon, July 1969 A.D. We came in peace for all mankind. And that plaque also had signatures of both astronauts and President Nixon. I'll bring you a picture tomorrow. Well... The uh, Lem ascends back 
It rendezvous with Columbia. Armstrong and Aldrin moved from the LEM to the command module, and then the LEM Eagle was jettisoned in the lunar orbit. Yeah. What is the other guy been doing? Just hanging out. Just chilling. Just chilling. They weren't up there that long. So you picture that. They come back together above the Earth. They dock again. The astronauts come into this part, and they just jettison the LEM out. And the LEM, LEM eventually uh, crashed into the moon somewhere. They never did find the location. Now Apollo 12, when they went in, in their, their moon mission, they saw no evidence of the LEM during their orbit. They didn't see the LEM in orbit, so the assumption was it crashed on the surface of the moon. The dark side? What's that? The dark side of the moon? I don't know what's what side. You kind of got it going there, don't you? Okay, splash down in quarantine. Splash down in quarantine. On July 24, 1969, the astronauts splashed down in the Pacific Ocean east of Wake Island. On July 24, 1969, the command module Columbia splashed down in the Pacific Ocean east of Wake Island in the Pacific. They're about 13 nautical miles from the recovery ship, which was the USS Hornet. So they were approximately 13 nautical miles from the recovery ship, which was the USS Hornet. Of what island? Wake Islands. Wake isn't its name on it. With that splashdown, NASA had backed up the promise of President Kennedy he made in 61, stating he would land, we would land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. July of 69, but we got it done. Now, after they splashed down, the astronauts were given bigs by divers, their biological isolation garments. So after splashdown, divers provided the two excuse me, the three astronauts with bigs, biological isolation garments. And they wore those until they reached the isolation facilities aboard the USS Hornet. So after splashdown, divers provided the astronauts with bigs, biological isolation garments, which the astronauts wore until they reached the isolation facility above aboard the USS Hornet. They had to do 21 days of quarantine after they landed. 21 days of quarantine. Why did they do that? Why did they make them quarantine? If you're close. The practice of quarantine and astronauts continued until the moon was proven to be barren of life. Baron of life. So both Apollo 12 and Apollo 14 had the quarantine. After that, they were done. Why didn't Apollo 13 have the quarantine? Didn't land on the moon, didn't make it. Very good. Now, President Nixon personally welcomed the astronauts back to Earth. He was aboard the USS Hornet. And on August 10, 1969, Collins, Aldrin, and Armstrong exited quarantine. So Nixon personally welcomed the astronauts back to Earth aboard the USS Hornet, and on August 10, 1969, Collins, Aldrin, and Armstrong exited quarantine. Did they stay on the ship the whole time? Or? Yes. Okay, celebration. We'll be finish this up with tell you what happened at the end. Celebration. On August 13, 1969, they had a busy day. The astronauts rode in parades in their honor in three big cities, New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles. So they put on big parades in New York City, Chicago, and Los Angeles on August 13, 1969. Those astronauts were celebrated. They were also given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by who? Nixon. Nixon. 
And then they start, that, that, that August 13, 1969, was the beginning of a 45-day tour in which they would travel to 25 foreign countries and visit many prominent leaders across the world. So they are basically on display for 45 days after the parades. Can you say that again? Yep. They were, the, the celebration was the beginning of a 45-day tour in which the astronauts would travel to 25 foreign countries. They would visit many prominent leaders across the world during that 45-day tour of celebration. How many countries? 25. 45-day 25. 25 tour, 25 <laughs> countries. On September 16, 1969, the three astronauts spoke before a joint session of Congress on Capitol Hill. What's a joint session of Congress? Senate and House, Senate and House are there. So they... On uh, September 16, 1969, Aldrin, Collins, and Armstrong spoke before a joint session of Congress. They presented two American flags that had been carried to the surface of the moon. They gave one to the House and one to the Senate. Okay. Yeah, on September 16, 1969, Aldrin, Collins, and Armstrong spoke before a joint session of Congress on Capitol Hill, and they presented two American flags that they had carried to the surface of the moon. One of the flags was given to the House, and one was given to the Senate. And, and the command module, Columbia, what's the deal? You can't keep it all with all that. Well, you can watch the video. The command module, Columbia, as I mentioned, is displayed at the National Air and Space Museum, and we'll get a chance to see that. It's kind of cool. Now, now, here's a good story to end this up. Deke Slate was the man that got to choose who was the first man on the surface of the moon. He chose the astronauts and he chose who was going to be the first man to walk on the moon. He originally wanted Frank Borman to take this trip because Borman had commanded Apollo 8 and Slayton thought that Borman's experience might make the difference between success and failure for that actual moon landing. So Slayton actually offered Frank Borman the opportunity to be the first man to set foot on the moon, and he turned him down. Now, I want you to listen to this because it's kind of cool. It's on your ID sheet. There's a, there's a historian by the name of Andrew, Andrew Chalkin, and he was a co-author of a book called Voices from the Moon, and he interviewed both Slayton and Borman about this, and this is what this author stated. He said about Borman, quote, he was a team player, a military man, happy to have made the big play, but didn't feel the need to score the touchdown. And his wife was anxious for him to stop flying and risking his life. Now I'll tell you something about Frank Borman. He's an incredible man. His, he lives in Heisham, Montana, which is just a, but between Billings and Forsyth, my hometown. He owns a ranch there. His wife has Alzheimer's, badly. And he dedicates his entire day, 24-7, to his wife. The day I had a chance to meet him, he was coming down to buy a car from my friend Brent Heverly. And he didn't spend a lot of time there. He spent enough time to visit with me for a little while. And he was driving immediately to Billings to see his wife. He drives from Heisham to Billings every day, takes his wife out for lunch, and drives home every single day. She's in a facility there. How long is that drive? Oh, from Heisham, it's about 80. 80 miles, miles yeah. So, and when I talked to him a little bit, you know, I didn't get too much involved, but he said he was going to see his wife, she was just doing terribly, he said to me, he kind of got tears as I'm not making this up, he goes, you know, she sat home, I don't know how many nights, worrying about whether I was going to make it back from space, it's the least I could do for him. He's an incredible man, I wish, I wish we could get him here to talk to you, but he just does nothing but spend time with her, because, you know, time's going to come. Okay, now... Tomorrow, we're going to start talking about the Manson family murders, an interesting time in history, I'll tell you. Um, just an incredible few days in history of just total crime and murder. Okay, so that's what we'll do tomorrow.